On behalf of the Graduate Law Society of the University of Cambridge, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth edition of the Cambridge Arbitration Day. Since its inception in 2014, the Cambridge Arbitration Day has endeavored to bring together scholars, practitioners, and students of international arbitration to discuss recent developments in the field. With this in mind, this year's event, titled Winds of Change, Rethinking the Future of International Arbitration, will assess those changes that are giving arbitration a new shape. Without further ado, allow me to present Professor Richard Fenderman, who has kindly agreed to deliver the welcome address. Professor Fenderman holds the double distinction of being the Professor of Public International Law and also the Chair of the Law Faculty here. Professor Fenderman is the author of the widely cited books International Commercial Litigation and Foreign Law in English Courts. Among his many accomplishments, Professor Fenderman was awarded the University's Pilkington Prize for Excellence in Teaching recently. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you, Professor Fenderman. Thank you. And I would like to extend to you all, on behalf of the Faculty of Law, our most hearty welcome to Cambridge and to the Faculty and to the Arbitration Day. It is, I think, especially appropriate that there should be a conference about arbitration in Cambridge. And I want to say something briefly about our long-standing connections with arbitration. We have, of course, a very long tradition of teaching and research in the area of dispute resolution, which spans the whole range of relevant topics, uh, investment treaty disputes, uh, hardcore commercial litigation in the commercial court, arbitration, and we also have a course on civil procedure which is heavily focused on alternative dispute resolution. It's particularly fitting, perhaps, uh, that we should have this event in Cambridge because of the long-standing association of this faculty with that great work, Mustill and Boyd. Lord Mustill, when he retired from what was then the House of Lords, became a visiting professor in this faculty, and we had the distinction that arbitration was then taught by no less a person than Michael Mustill. This tradition, of course, has been continued because uh, my colleague, Neil Andrews, the professor of civil procedure, uh, is one of the authors of Mustill and Boy. I should just say that our commitment to arbitration is also reflected in the fact that we have in the faculty as our top priority in terms of fundraising, raising funds for the establishment of a permanent professorship in international commercial arbitration. I should just say that if anybody wishes to donate, uh, forms are available at the back of the room. Actually, I, I was only joking, but, but if somebody does, does want to contribute, then, then you're most welcome to do so. I would also say that the links between this faculty and arbitration are also reinforced by the enthusiasm of our students uh, for topic. I think here of the extraordinary energy which is being displayed at the moment by our Viz Moot team, of whom we have, to quote Charles Dickens, great expectations. This is also reflected, of course, in the very hard work which has gone into the organisation of this event today. Even though we are all at five minutes in, I think I can already say this is going to be a very successful event, and I commend the organisers um, on their very considerable efficiency, and in particular on providing the best pastries and coffee in Cambridge for the breakfast. <laughs> more seriously, the theme today, Winds of Change, could not be more timely with the likely invocation of Article 50 next week. Now, of course, if you are an English lawyer, your every waking hour, and indeed sleeping hour, is dominated by thoughts of Brexit. But you may be asking yourselves, what has this to do with international commercial arbitration? Possibly a great deal. Brexit begs a significant but difficult question. What will be the effect of this new landscape on legal services in the United Kingdom? In particular, what will happen 
to the world dominance, if I may say so, of the London Commercial Court as a setting for the resolution of commercial disputes. I say that partly, of course, as someone who teaches a course called International Commercial Litigation, and I'd very much like to know the answer to that question. There are many ways in which we can approach the issue of how Brexit might affect legal services, and in particular commercial dispute resolution in England. But I think at root, there are two issues. What will be the effect on English jurisdiction agreements, the security of which is now guaranteed by Article 25 of the Brussels 1 regulation throughout Europe, and what will be the fate in future of judgments rendered by the English courts, which are now, of course, subject to more or less automatic recognition and enforcement as a result of the Brussels 1 regulation on jurisdiction. Of course, different answers are possible, and it's not my place here to explore these. It may be, of course, that nothing will happen, or at least nothing serious will occur, particularly if the United Kingdom does ratify unilaterally, as it may do the Hague Convention on Choice of Court Agreements, then the security of our jurisdiction agreements in the rest of Europe will be assured, not by EU law, but by an international treaty. Again, even without the automatic enforcement mechanisms of the Brussels regulation, I think it is possible to say, without being an expert on comparative law, that an English judgment would be capable of recognition and enforcement under the national laws of other EU states. Alternatively, of course, there is the more serious possibility, the more worrying possibility for English lawyers, that, for example, commercial litigation will migrate to Dublin, the famous Dublin option. The Dublin option basically means that commercial parties who by and large favour the application of English substantive law to their transactions, will still want English substantive law, but they will want their disputes to be resolved in the courts of an EU state. Ireland is an EU state. It is also an EU state whose first language is English and which is a common law system. Basically, what people are saying is, a judge in Dublin can apply English law pretty much just as well as a judge in England, but any judgment rendered will be subject to automatic enforcement under the regulation. My own take on the Dublin option is that this is a perfectly good option, but there is, of course, another possible common law jurisdiction in the EU which might be a suitable destination, and that is Malta, where the climate is infinitely warmer than in Ireland. Maybe, however, and here you can see the answer to the question I posed, what has this to do with arbitration? It may be, of course, that the answer lies in arbitration, in increased use of arbitration, possibly the increased use of hybrid jurisdiction and arbitration clauses um, in commercial contracts. The point being, of course, that arbitration has always sat outside the regime of the Brussels regulation, and the issues about party autonomy and enforcement are of course dealt with uh, by the New York Convention, which has nothing whatever to do uh, with uh, the EU regime. This wouldn't be the first time that arbitration has responded to difficulties in civil litigation. Some of you will remember the famous, I'm tempted to say, infamous decision of the Court of Justice in a case called Eric Gasser. The effect of that decision was effectively to render worthless exclusive jurisdiction agreements in commercial contracts. That has since been corrected by the new recast regulation, but of course an instant response on the part of those who were drafting commercial um, documents was to resort to a hitherto unforeseen extent to arbitration for the resolution of, in particular, the kind of high-grade financial disputes which normally get litigated. More to the point, what tended to happen was that hybrid um, jurisdiction and arbitration clauses were introduced. One may hypothesise that this is exactly what will happen now as a response to Brexit. This does, however, pose many questions, 
and as someone who is, as it were, primarily a civil litigator, not an arbitrator, one of those questions, I simply leave it hanging, is whether, of course, arbitration is a suitable mechanism for dealing with the highly complex, multi-party, predominantly financial disputes which tend to be litigated in the commercial court in London. Certainly, whatever happens, arbitration is going to be front and centre in the post-Brexit debate. So we can see that the winds of change are blowing indeed. We cannot say where they will blow us. For that, we need a fortune teller. We need a clairvoyant. We don't have a clairvoyant here today, but we do have the next best thing. We have a guru. That is to say, Monsieur Yves Durand. He needs no introduction to anyone working in the arbitration community. He is, of course, the founding partner of Durand and Garabi. He is a former Secretary General of the ICC Court and Chairman of the ICC Institute of World Business Law. He is, I venture to say, not someone who merely knows the law, as it were, but someone who created it, as someone who, of course, led the review of the ICC rules um, on two separate occasions, um, leading to the current form of those rules. He is, I think, uniquely qualified, both as somebody with experience as an arbitrator and as um, uh, an administrator of arbitration and as a counsel in arbitration, to speak to us today about this exciting theme of rethinking the future of international arbitration. So may I now hand over to our keynote speaker, Mr. Eve Dan.